We all go through different chapters in our lives, some stranger than others. Welcome to Strange Chapters, where we bring you true stories of the strange, the macabre, the paranormal, and the supernatural. So sit back, relax, and let's get to this week's featured author and their stories. everybody welcome back to strange chapters this week we are featuring three stories from sylvia schultz book grave deeds and dead plots i will have all the links in the show notes so you can go check out this awesome book for yourself and check out more of uh, sylvia's books and more of her stories so sit back relax and enjoy these strange stories Story 1. Quick Justice Ernest Augustus, the Duke of Cumberland and Queen Victoria's uncle, was one of the most feared men in England. He was, to begin with, fearsome to look at. He'd been terribly wounded by a blow to the head in battle in May 1794. He had gruesome scars on his face, and he'd lost an eye. He also had a reputation for being unscrupulous, overbearing, and sexually adventurous. He was generally considered the black sheep of an already weird family. In the early morning hours of May 31, 1810, It seemed that fate had caught up to Cumberland. He was attacked with his own sword as he slept. Although the weapon was razor sharp, the assailant used the flat of the blade, not the newly sharpened edge. Even so, the first blow split Cumberland's skull wide open, cutting so deeply exposed his brain. Three more blows fell as he stumbled from his bed. With a rush of adrenaline, Cumberland yelled, Neil, Neil, I am murdered! Cornelius Neil, the Duke's valet, came rushing in, but found Cumberland alone in his room. His attacker had fled, leaving the bloody sword on the floor. Neil made sure Cumberland was safe and called for a doctor. Then he went in search of the would-be murderer. The only member of the household, unaccounted for, was Cumberland's valet, Joseph Sellis. His slippers, though, were found in the Duke's bedroom closet, the place where it was thought the attacker had hidden, before slinking out to attack Cumberland. Sellis had to be found. Two servants were sent to Sellis's room. As they approached, they heard a disgusting gurgling sound. They threw open the door and found Sellis lying on his bed, drowning in his own blood. His throat had been slashed with a straight razor so deeply that only his spine had stopped the blade. An inquest was thrown together, and it was decided that Sellis had tried to murder Cumberland. Failing at that, he had retreated to his room and committed suicide. Court gossip, though, said otherwise. Sellis's head had been nearly severed from his body. There was no way, people muttered, that such a wound could be self-inflicted. To add to the confusion, they pointed out that Sellis's hands were clean but there was a basin filled with bloody water on his nightstand. So did Sellis almost cut his own head off and stop to wash his hands? That didn't make any sense either. The straight razor found at the scene was nowhere near Sellis' hand, but a policeman had an explanation for that. Sergeant Joseph Crichton admitted that he picked it up and looked at it, then had set it down several feet away. The crime scene hadn't just been contaminated, it had been rearranged. If Sellis hadn't committed suicide, who had killed him? The alternative scenarios were varied and imaginative. Sellis had found Cumberland in bed with his wife, or Cumberland had seduced Sellis' daughter, who had killed herself when she discovered she was pregnant. Or Sellis and Cumberland had been lovers, and when the other valet, Neil, had been hired, Neil had taken Sellis' place in the Duke's bed. Or, 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 the mystery had never been solved. Maybe that's why Joseph Sellis haunts St. James Palace. His shadowy figure still roams the halls, accompanied by the coppery stink of fresh blood. Palace staff often report feeling as if they're being watched, and small objects get moved or go missing. The haunting is particularly severe in the room where Sellis was killed. A few unfortunate witnesses claim to have seen the specter of Joseph Sellis sitting in his bed, propped upon the edge of death, his mouth hanging open over a grisly wound in his neck, his head nearly severed from his body. Story 2. Double Double, Blood and Trouble, or... The faces on the gravestones. Take the story of Olga and Heinrich Schultz, for example. The elderly couple lived in Cherokee County in Iowa, near the town of Washta, in the early 1900s. Heinrich found that he needed some temporary help bringing in the harvest of hay, so he hired a drifter named Will Florence. Heinrich and Olga were liked in the community, 
and Heinrich's neighbors told him flatly that they didn't trust the sullen stranger. Florence had drifted into the area some time before in such a work. Most of Heinrich's neighbors, not liking the looks of the fellow, had sent him on his way. But Heinrich had a generous heart, and he hated to see anyone down on their luck. He hired Florence, even providing him with room and board, in addition to his wages. Florence was no one's idea of a model employee. He was tight-lipped about his past. He told Heinrich that he had experience with outdoorsy-type work, but Heinrich found him clumsy and awkward with even the simplest farm chores. Nevertheless, true to his patient nature, the older man walked Florence through the tasks expected of him. One afternoon, Heinrich heard, through the grapevine, that the bank in his town was edging towards failure. The Great Depression was a couple of decades in the future, but even at that time, banks were going under with worrisome frequency. Heinrich decided to err on the side of caution. Leaving Olga at home, he headed into Washta to withdraw his money. If either cash would be safer hidden away in his mattress or in a mason jar in the backyard than it would be in a teetering bank. Three days later, the Schultz's neighbors realized that no one had seen or heard from the couple in several days. A friend came by to check on them, opened the front door, and walked into the scene from a horror movie. Heinrich and Olga were laying in the kitchen in a huge pool of blood. Their heads had been split open with an axe. The house was ransacked. The money that Heinrich had withdrawn from his bank account was missing, and so was Will Florence. Florence was tracked down a few days later in Nebraska. He was arrested and taken back to Iowa. The prosecutor in Washta really wanted to indict Florence for the murder of the Schultzes and dragged the vagrant in front of a grand jury. However, there just wasn't enough evidence to get an indictment, let alone a conviction. Will Florence was released and left town in a hurry. Heinrich and Olga Schultz were laid to rest in the cemetery in Washta. As friends and neighbors paid their respects at the grave over the next few weeks, they began to notice something strange about the gravestone that marked an elderly couple's final resting place. A stain was beginning to form on the stone, a stain that, if you squinted, sort of looked a little bit like the face of Will Florence. People really wanted, needed, someone to blame for the senseless double murder. The concerned citizens of Washta finally convinced two police detectives to take a look at the stone. The face on the gravestone had become clearer by then, and people generally agreed it did look like the accused murderer. Maybe the Schultzes were trying to prove that Will Florence was the one who'd done them in. The detectives couldn't arrest Florence again simply based on a weird-looking stain, but they agreed that the case could stand a closer look. They reopened the case and discovered new evidence and investigators had missed the first time around. The fresh evidence pointed solidly to Will Florence as a killer, and the authorities issued a warrant for his arrest. But Will Florence had disappeared for good this time. Maybe he, too, had heard of the face on the gravestone. At any rate, he went to ground more thoroughly than he had done before. He was never brought to justice for the murder of Heinrich and Olga Schultz. The stone, though, remained as a mute witness to his guilt. There's also the story of Martin and Helena Schultz. Martin and his wife were both natives of Germany who immigrated to the United States. Martin Schultz was born October 25, 1833, in Prussia. Helena Katharina Montaigne was born in Oldenburg, Germany, on April 1, 1845. Little is known about Martin's life before he married Lena, but we know that the Montaignes came to America in 1845. They arrived via the Gulf Coast, not the East Coast, and settled in Texas for six years. In 1851, the family returned to Germany, and Lena's mother passed away. In 1863, Lena's father came back to America, and his children joined him a year later. Helena married Martin Schultz, and they began farming. In the 1870s, John and George Montaigne both bought land in Cherokee County, Iowa. In 1880, they invited their sisters and brother-in-law to join them there. Martin and Lena moved to Cherokee County in 1880, taking Lena's brother up on their offer. They were fiercely independent, living alone in a small house in Tilden Township, a mile from any neighbors. They rented 80 acres from Lena's brother, John. He and Helena's other brother, George Montaigne Sr., were both wealthy landowners. The Schultzes had that dream for themselves, too. They stocked away every cent they made in hopes of buying the land they farmed. The couple spent little on themselves and kept their savings in their house rather than trusting a bank. Banks at the time, in the last decade of the 19th century, were notorious for being unstable. Runs on banks where people suddenly withdrew all their savings in a panic, causing a bank to fail, were common. Rumor had it that the couple had over $1,000 in cash hidden in their house. And this is quite an accomplishment, especially for the Schultzes. Helena, who went by the diminutive Lena, was herself diminutive. In fact, she was listed in the 1890 census as a hunchback who suffered from spinal complaint. Martin wasn't a big guy either. The Cedar Rapids Gazette later wrote that both were below the average size, the old lady being a deformed cripple and no more than four feet in height. So running their own 80-acre farm can have been easy, but they made it work. They had kind, helpful neighbors, and they had each other. Their quiet life together came to a gruesome end. On the morning of August 17, 1893, neighbor Nick Hawk came to one of the Martins' fields to help stack grain. 
But Martin didn't show up. Hawk went to the house and knocked on the front door. There was no answer, so he went around to the back of the house. The scene that met his eyes in the backyard was one of sheer butchery. Lena lay at the corner of the house, six feet from the summer kitchen door, which stood ajar. Her head was a gory mess. Her face and skull were a ruin of savage blows. She'd been struck so hard with the murder weapon that six of her teeth were scattered on the blood-soaked ground. Investigators determined that Lena had been killed the night before, just before dusk, when there was still enough light to move around the farmyard. She'd been carrying a water dipper, so she'd been on her way either to or from the well. In the kitchen was a lump of fresh butter that Lena had taken from the churn just before heading out to the well. When a housewife turns cream into butter, the newly made butter has to be washed in cool water to get the last of the buttermilk out, or it'll go sour. The horror continued in the house. Martin lay in a small bedroom, his head split open with gashes two inches deep, his face pulped beyond recognition. His left arm was bruised and cut with defensive wounds. The floor was sticky with congealed blood, and bloody fingerprints smeared the handle of the door between the bedroom and the sitting room. Near Martin's body was a hammer, covered in blood and brains. The coroner's jury, convened the same day, ruled that Lena and Martin had been murdered with a blunt instrument. Authorities didn't yet have a suspect, but their reason was probably someone who knew the Schultzes, and knew that they had a secret stash of cash. The killer ransacked the house looking for the money, but investigators were unsure of how much had been stolen, as they had no idea how much had been hidden in the first place. It was determined that between $250 and $300 was missing from the deerskin pocketbook, but the intruder missed $5.45 tucked in an old Bible and $2.55 squirreled away in a baking powder can on the second floor. By August 20, neighbors had gathered up about $1,000, a reward for the capture of the killer. The Cherokee County Board of Supervisors kicked in another $500, and Iowa Governor Horace Bowles offered enough to bring the total to an even $2,000. And so the hunt began. In mid-September, 30-year-old Jack Skinner was arrested in Sioux City for the murders. It was reported that Skinner had been sulking around outside the Schultz farmhouse on the night of the killings. Witnesses also said that Skinner, a generally unsavory character, was broke before the murders but seemed to have plenty of spending money afterwards. Skinner was clapped into the Cherokee County Jail to await his grand jury trial. Sheriff Dan Unger was so concerned that public fury at the crime would lead to Skinner's being lynched that he stationed an extra guard on Skinner's cell. But there was no evidence to link Skinner to the crime, so he was released on October 11th. Pinkerton operatives were called in to investigate the case. They picked up several local bad types, including Will Florence, but the suspects were all released with no evidence could be found for their guilt. Despite the sizable reward, authorities could not come up with suspects in the crime and make the charges stick. It began to look as though Lena and Martin's killer would never be found. Two years after the murders, though, it seemed that there was a break in the case. But instead of bringing jubilation, the news was deeply disconcerting. Lena's own brother, George Montaigne Sr., was arrested on November 10, 1895, for the murder of his sister and brother-in-law. An informant had said that he'd heard George Sr. confess to the crime on three different occasions. This was unbelievable, and nobody believed it. He was soon cleared and released. Six years after that, on September 6, 1901, George Montaigne Jr., Lena's 27-year-old nephew, told Sheriff John Hill that he'd helped his father and uncle, George Sr., and John Montaigne, kill the Schultzes. This news was greeted with skepticism. The community had been spoofed before. But County Attorney J.A. Miller took the man's detailed confession. George Jr. claimed that he'd driven the two older men to the Schultz farm and that he held the reins of the horses, standing with them under the shade of the tree while the others killed his aunt and uncle. He said they had taken the stash money and had given him $80, which he stuffed into a tin can and buried under a tree. Then he took it all back. The whole confession was a joke, he said. Miller called his bluff and brought him before a grand jury. George Jr. then made his confession. He had indeed been involved in the murder of his aunt and uncle, and it was his father, George Sr., and his uncle John who were the killers. Then he took it back again. Nope, it was just a joke. That's when Miller remembered that in July of 1900, the Insanity Commission had found George Jr. to be insane and had committed him to a state asylum. He'd been released after treatment and sent home. Miller brought George Jr. before the commission again. This time, the members found him not insane, only simple. Miller also discovered that George Jr. was harboring a grudge against his father. He thought he was going to be given a quarter section of the family farm when he turned 27, but it hadn't happened. So George Jr. refused to do any farm work at all until he got his land and just left around and made up lies about his father killing his relatives. Investigators realized that their potential lead was quite possibly mentally ill and most certainly seeking attention and revenge. They couldn't consider George Jr.'s testimony with any seriousness. Another possible suspect popped up in March of 1899. Martha Nellis, a former Cherokee County resident living in South Dakota, told the police that her husband, Oscar Nellis, had killed Martin and Lena Schultz. Her story was this. In 1893, she and Oscar had been living on a farm about a mile from the Schultzes. They'd heard the rumors that the couple had squared away money in order to buy the land they were currently renting. Martha said 
that on the night of August 16th, 1893, they'd gone to bed around 9 p.m., but Oscar had got up around 10 p.m. and got dressed, saying, I'm going over to rob those Schultzes. They've got some money, and I want it. She said she tried to talk Oscar out of his plan without success. According to Martha's story, Oscar came back later, saying that he had killed Lena when she woke up and caught him robbing the house. He left, then realized that Martin would be able to identify him, so he went back and killed Martin as well. A week after the murders, the Nellises moved west, first to Oklahoma, then settling in South Dakota. Martha claimed that for six years, she'd been simmering in guilt and fear, as Oscar threatened to kill her if she told anyone what he'd done. Martha said she had heard rumors that another woman was going to claim she'd been married to the man who killed Martin and Lena Schultz, and so collect the $2,000 reward. Martha said that as she herself knew that wasn't true, she wanted to prevent this other woman from claiming the reward under false pretenses. Sheriff Hill and Yankton Sheriff W.M. Hickey arrested Nellis in Lodi, South Dakota, and took him back to Cherokee County. He was later sent to the Woodbury County Jail in Sioux City. Nellis said, though, that he had had nothing to hide. He had an alibi for the night of the murder. On April 10, 1899, the preliminary hearing in the matter of Nellis's guilt or innocence was ended, and the case against him was dismissed. Lena and Martin Schultz were laid to rest in Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Quimby, Iowa. The cemetery was tended by groundskeeper John Williams. Williams became obsessed with the granite headstones that marked the couple's final resting place. He swore to anyone he would listen that a picture was forming on the side of the headstone, a stain on the granite that looked like the faces of Lena and Martin, complete with the ghastly wounds of their violent deaths. The community ran with this. Although many had a different interpretation of the discoloration on the stone, many people believed there was only one face forming in the stain, that when the development was complete, it would reveal the identity of the person who had murdered the Schultzes. The stonemason who had carved the stone tried to sell the matter. He had made the gravestone out of half a slab of Vermont granite, and he brought the other half out and put it on display. He said that, in his opinion, the natural striations in the stone looked like dogs or cats, not human faces. But people stuck to their original interpretations. As time passed and the face, or faces, didn't get any clearer, and no one was found guilty of the murders, people grudgingly admitted that maybe the marks were just discolorations in the stone after all. But human nature, being what it is, the whole affair now had the mysterious allure of the paranormal about it. Neighbors started claiming that the Schultz house was haunted, with unexplained lights moving between the darkened rooms at night. So what's going on here? The website for Find a Grave only has records for Lena and Martin Schultz. Putting Olga and Henrik Schultz into Google only results in a retelling of this story. Both couples were farm folk, people of the land. Olga and Henrik were elderly, while Lena and Martin were younger. Martin was 60 when he was murdered, hardly elderly, and Lena was only 48. Both couples, if indeed were two couples, were savagely murdered. The crime or crimes resulted in two remarkably similar paranormal occurrences. And what about Will Florence, who seems to have a connection to both double murders? Is he the missing link here, or is he just mentioned in both stories? And come to that, are there two stories? Lena and Martin were killed August 17th, and Laura holds that Heinrich hired Will Florence to help with the haying, which happens in mid-August. Lena and Martin's grave is marked by a granite headstone, while Olga and Heinrich were purportedly honored with a stone made of marble. One stone showed the face of alleged killer, while the other displayed the murdered couple. Washta, where Olga and Heinrich were supposed to have lived, and Quimby, where Lena and Martin were actually buried, are only about five miles apart in Cherokee County. Maybe in the retelling, people got their places mixed up. Schultz is not an uncommon surname, I should know. But here, we have Lena and Martin, and Olga and Heinrich, and not, say, Lee and Marvin. Why are the names of the couple so obviously different? We may never know. The only thing certain is we have not one, but two stories of gruesome death and telltale gravestones. Story 3. Murder in Plymouth About halfway between Plymouth Rock and Barrow Hill in Plymouth, Massachusetts, is a pleasant little road called Layden Street. It wasn't always called this. It started out as First Street, and for a very good reason. This is, well, the first street laid out by the Pilgrims before Christmas in 1620, the year they landed on these shores. In 1823, it was renamed Layden Street in honor of the city in Holland, where the Pilgrims paused for a while before coming to the New World. It claims to be the oldest continuously inhabited street in the 13 colonies. At 21 Layden Street, there stands an apartment building. It looks perfectly ordinary, just like the others on the street, a pretty, neat example of architecture that even the pilgrims would have admired. But there is something that sets this dwelling apart from the other tidy New England buildings on this little slice of Plymouth. In 1997, police made a truly horrifying discovery in the attic of 21 Layden Street. But let's turn the clocks back a bit. 
1996, a married couple, Victor and Carol Ann Cardarelli, lived in a third-floor apartment in the building. Their relationship was fraught, to say the least. Although they both worked, the Cardarellis were having financial issues. In late 1996, Victor was trying to settle some child support obligations. He had children from a previous marriage. In order to facilitate this, he gave up his claim to a share of the house he owned with his ex-wife. This frustrated Carol deeply. She had been hoping that she and Victor could buy a house on their own and move out of the apartment. To add to the precariousness of the financial situation, less than three weeks later, Victor lost his job. Carol's friends and relatives couldn't help but notice her anxiety, heightened by these two blows to their stability. In fact, Carol was feeling quite overwhelmed. In early November, Carol missed a friend's wedding, and after the Veterans Day weekend, she didn't return to work. Coworkers and relatives alike had questions, lots of them. But Victor had answers for them, sort of. On November 11, 1996, when a coworker called the apartment to check up on Carol's tardiness, she was usually on time. Victor told her that Carol had gone to California. He said that a member of Carol's family had been in a serious car accident. But when Linda Hendrick, Carol's daughter-in-law, called too, Victor told a different tale. He said that Carol was in the hospital recovering from a dental work. Linda, during her own sleuthing, called all the hospitals in the Plymouth area. Unsurprisingly, her search turned up no clue as to Carol's whereabouts. Suspicious and worried, Linda called the police. The Plymouth police had also been contacted by one of Carol's co-workers. So on November 17th, they took a quick look inside the apartment. They found it immaculate, but empty. Carol and Victor were both gone. Linda stayed in contact with the police throughout December 1996 and early January 1997, but the police didn't have any leads. They did, however, have an idea that something hinky was going on. Detective John Rogers Jr. of the Plymouth Police Department put together a paper trail on Victor Cartarelli. Following his trail revealed that Victor had taken out numerous credit card advances and had drained his bank accounts, held jointly with Carol. Then, he'd gambled the money at various casinos in Connecticut and Atlantic City, New Jersey, between November 9th, a day after Carol was last seen, and November 24th. Victor spent two weeks living it up in Atlantic City. He made two cash withdrawals from his and Carol's joint bank account, totaling $5,000, which left a zero balance. He bought $7,500 worth of traveler's checks, nearly wiping out another joint account. He made at least seven cash advances on credit cards at various casinos, totaling nearly $11,000. And to add insult to injury, he pawned Carol's gold necklace for $35. He had a story ready for this part of his adventure too, a sob story. He told a casino employee that his wife had died of cancer and that his co-workers had generously taken up a collection so that he could travel to Atlantic City. After his gambling spree in New Jersey, Victor spent 11 weeks racking up miles on the lam. He drove to Key West, Florida and visited his mother at her mobile home park in Barefoot Bay. He told her yet another story. He got as far as telling her that Carol was dying when his mother told him the police were looking for him. Carol's friends and relatives, including Linda Hendrick, were still leaning on the police to solve the mystery of her sudden disappearance. The nationally broadcast true crime show America's Most Wanted even got involved. Victor realized the heat was on. He left his mother's home within hours and spent several weeks driving around the southern U.S. He wandered as far as Galveston, Texas, living in his car, eating at fast food joints, and bathing at rest stops or in hotel swimming pools. In February 1997, he made his way back north to Atlantic City. Meanwhile, the landlord of Victor and Carol's apartment told Linda that the Carterellis were so far behind on their rent he was planning to evict them. Carol was still missing, and Victor, too, was nowhere to be found. So Linda and her husband decided to clean out the apartment. They arrived in Plymouth, January 10, 1997. When they stepped into the apartment, they noticed an odd smell, a pungent odor that stung Linda's nose, almost like vinegar. They also noticed, as they made their way through the place, but some of Carol's clothes and jewelry were missing. Linda's uneasy feeling led her and her husband into the couple's bedroom. They turned the mattress over and discovered bloodstains and bloody towels. Horrified, they immediately contacted the authorities. State troopers found three bloodstained towels on the box spring mattress. The mattress itself was liberally soaked with blood, and there was cast-off blood splatter on the walls and the ceiling of the bedroom. This was enough for police to bring in a cadaver dog to search for the body. The next day, Saturday, January 11th, the dog led the police to the attic of the apartment building. A body, tightly wrapped in bedding and plastic, was found in a crawl space behind a wall in the attic. Dental records proved that the partially decomposed corpse was Carol Ann Cardarelli. She had been missing for over three months. An autopsy revealed that Carol had died in early November and that she had suffered numerous fractures of her face and skull and severe damage to her brain. The official cause of death was severe blunt force trauma to the head. Semicircular fractures in her skull matched a cast iron frying pan that was found near the bed. Blood spatter analysis showed that she had been struck at least three times, possibly more. 
By Sunday afternoon, Victor Cardarelli was wanted for murder. The discovery of Carol's body was a shock to the community. It was made even worse by the fact that searchers had already looked in the attic the month before her body was actually found. Diane Knight lived across the hall from the Cardarellis. She and one of Carol's sons had searched the attic without success. Knight told a reporter from Plymouth's Old Colony Memorial newspaper that she had even looked into the crawl space where Carol's body was hidden, but personal belongings were blocking her view into the small space, and she was reluctant to go poking through them. Diane and Carol's son decided instead to look in a different part of the attic. The newspaper account said that according to local legend, the other hideaway had been used as part of the Underground Railroad. Even as she helped look for her friend, Diane hoped that Carol would soon turn up safe and sound. Those hopes were dashed when Carol's body was discovered under the front eaves of the building, just above Diane's second-floor apartment. I'm in shock, Diane told reporter Rich Harbert. It's still just starting to sink in that I lived here for two months with her up in the attic like that. Diane had moved out of the building just a week before the gruesome discovery. She didn't deserve to be chucked in a corner like that. She was a really nice person. She didn't deserve what she got. Diane wasn't alone in her shock and grief. Carol was described by all as an elegant lady, a wonderful, kind, and caring person. All of Plymouth was horrified that such a violent crime could claim such a lovely lady, and on one of the most historic streets in America, no less. But now that the victim had been found, the hunt was on for her murderer. Since Victor Cardarelli was known to be a gambler, and since he'd hung out for a while in Atlantic City, where after Carol had disappeared, authorities focused their search there. On February 4th, 1997, Victor used his casino loyalty reward card to try and cash out what was left on his account, a whopping $236. A sharp-eyed cashier recognized him and called the police. He was arrested at the resort's casino hotel in Atlantic City. He told law enforcement officers that he intended to win enough money to pay off his bills, then he was going to turn himself in. Yeah, right, Uh uh-huh. Victor was taken back to Massachusetts. He told detectives that he remembered Carol bleeding from the face, but that he couldn't remember how or why he had killed her. He did, though, admit to wrapping her corpse in bedding, then in plastic, and hiding it in the attic. During the murder trial, the Commonwealth showed the jury autopsy photos during the medical examiner's testimony. This is never a fun thing for anyone, but the prosecution tried to go about it as tactfully and tastefully as possible. The pictures were cropped to show just the fatal wounds, not decomposing flesh. Victor was upset about this, but he really brought it on himself. Since he claimed not to remember how he killed Carol, the prosecution had to use the photos to prove that the murder was a case of extreme violence and atrocity. The pictures graphically illustrated the nature and the extent of the fatal injuries in a way that the medical examiner's spoken testimony could not. Victor Cartarelli was convicted of first-degree murder. Five years later, in March of 2001, Victor appeared in court again. He claimed that the Commonwealth's use of autopsy photos influenced the jury and that he hadn't had a fair trial. He also thought it was unfair that the prosecution told the jury about his gambling spree after the murder and his wanderings through the South. He argued that his travels in plain sight in populated areas and the extensive use of credit cards meant that he didn't attempt to avoid arrest. The Supreme Court disagreed. We have examined the photographs and concluded they are not necessarily gruesome or shocking, was the response. If photographs of the victim have evidentiary value, as these undeniably do, Their gruesome nature does not render that inadmissible. In addition, during the original trial, the judge looked at each picture and thoughtfully warned the jurors that the images might be distressing. The conviction of murder in the first degree stood. The grisly business of Carol Ann Cartarelli's murder was not restricted to autopsy photos shown to a 4-1 jury. After police had investigated the apartment and the crime scene had been released, movers came in to clean out the place. During the clean-out, they left the box spring propped up against the dumpster, planning to take it to the dump, with the next load. When they returned for it, though, it was gone. Someone had taken it. As far as anyone knows, the mattress is still out there somewhere. The apartment in the building at 21 Layton Street still holds a vague imprint of Carol's spirit. Ghost tours in the area mention the apartment as a haunted site, although it's not open for investigation. But tour guides who paid attention noticed that for a very long time, no tenants stayed in the apartment for more than a few months. An interesting story from the apartment gives a hint about the haunting even if most tenants don't talk about their experiences. According to local stories, Carol was a huge fan of the 1970s program, Little House on the Prairie. Tenants had admitted that their television was sometimes turned on by themselves in the middle of the night. No matter what channel the set was tuned to, the show being broadcast was always the same. Yep, a rerun of, you guessed it, Little House on the Prairie. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us for these three awesome stories from author Sylvia Schultz. Go check the show notes for all the links to Sylvia's books 
and for grave deeds and dead plots. And you can read the rest of the stories in this series. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Strange Chapters and join us over on the social media on Facebook and hit that subscribe button on YouTube. All right, everybody, you stay safe out there and stay strange. By August 20th, neighbors had gathered up about $1,000, a reward for the capture of the killer. <laughs> the killer? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Did you kill him? No, I killed him. Sheriff Dan Unger was so concerned that public fury at the crime would lead to Skinner's being lynched. <laughs> Another possible suspect popped up in March. Another possible subject. <laughs> Another possible subject popped up in Another possible suspect popped up. Damn it. Martha Nellis, a former Cherokee County resident living in South Dakota. <laughs> South Dakota. I'm in shock, Diane told reporter Rich Harbert. I'm still just starting to. Fuck me. Fuck, 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 fuck.